Oh, wow, look at all these people here. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yeah, what I, was, what I was saying to Polly just before was an artist is somebody who does it better than it has to be done. Even if it's an engineer, for example. You know, some machines, you, 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 when you use the machine or see the machine, it's obvious that the designer, the engineer, really loved it, you know, and, and made it, maybe there's some specs he had to meet, you know, maybe the boss's approval, maybe the market's response, but he or she did it even better than that, better than it had to be, better than you can um, encompass in any measurement, in any quantification, and therefore better than you can encompass in any monetary value because money is a form of measure. And I guess um, this kind of points to another way of living and another way of relating to the world that, is, that cannot be encompassed in the, measure, in the measurements. And we've been very uh, deeply programmed to make decisions according to some set of, of measurable criteria. Ordinarily, in society, that set of measurable criteria comes down to money. What is the most um, rational decision? An economist would say that, yes, human beings are rational. They maximize their self-interest, and this self-interest can be measured um, in monetary terms. A lot of us are now noticing that that way of living is destroying the basis of human civilization, if not even causing more damage than that. So we're thinking, well, maybe we need to pursue some other measurable goal. Maybe we need to transfer this mentality, which, which I would call um, utilitarianism or even instrumental utilitarianism, but that makes it sound like I'm starting to, that, that I'm trying to be smart, which is tempting because even though there are many young people in the audience, um, there's part of me that also is afraid of what the grown-ups are gonna think. <laughs> and I see a lot of grown-ups here as well. So, you know, if I start like um, enacting the habits of school, which include trying to produce the right answer to please authority, then let me know. You'll notice if I start to get a little preachy, and then I'll do my goofy dance, <laughs> which, kind of, which kind of deprograms me from, from that way of being. Um, so where was I after that important aside? Yeah, so we think, OK, you know, let's, let's apply the same um, mentality of, of uh, maximizing a measurable quantity. Um, the same way of relating to the world of maximizing a number or minimizing a number and apply it to something else. Apply it to, um, you know, carbon footprint or uh, some other measure that we think encompasses the planet's well-being. I think that the, the problem we face, though, is a lot deeper than that. It's not just that we're measuring the wrong things. It's that the whole mentality of measurement is insufficient to the task at hand. And we need to begin to value the things that have been marginalized, which are the things that we don't measure because we don't see them as important, or the things that we cannot measure because they're fundamentally either beyond our capacity to measure or beyond any capacity to measure. Actually, according to the, the, the utilitarian mindset, none of the things that we need to start doing on a mass level make any sense on an individual level. If someone, suppose you tell somebody, you say, you know, we've got to really start um, uh, recycling. And they say, you know, and you should start recycling. And they say, well, why should I start recycling? 
Well, because uh, producing things from raw materials out of the ground creates a lot of CO2 and, and contributes to uh, the landfills and the plastic goes into the oceans and you, know, you give them all these reasons. They say, yeah, I understand that, but, but me personally, my contribution to that is negligible. What does it matter? And then you say, well, but if everybody thought like that, it would be a disaster. So you need to, you, you know, this is what, right, you know, Kantian morality. You know, you need to do what is necessary for everybody to do for us to have uh, a healthy planet. But I'm not everybody, he says. I'm just me. What does it matter? So you basically what you're trying to do is you end up saying you should do it because that is the good thing, that is the right thing. And already you're outside, is this clear? Outside the logic of utilitarianism. And what I'm saying is that we need to find other reasons to do things. Especially because our system of values and our understanding of cause and effect, our understanding of reality, is, I would say, part of the problem. And any solution that comes from our current values and understanding of causality is in hidden ways going to contribute to the problem. And I, I, I mentioned just one example in, um, no, in resurgence, but I'll, I'll raise another example. Uh, in North Carolina and South Carolina, there's this coastal forest that uh, is the only place in the world where Venus flytraps live. You know, those gigantic man-eating plants that, um, actually they're about this, there's like about this big. And they, they eat insects, but it's extremely biodiverse. Um, and that forest is being clear cut today. This ancient forest just being devastated. Why? In order to produce wood chips, which are then shipped to the UK uh, to burn in um, power plants that were once coal fired power plants to make electricity. And this is being justified because it is carbon neutral. And yeah, and so it helps the Drax, the power plant here, meet its government requirements for reducing carbon emissions. Um, and the company that is producing the wood chips and the power plant and everybody involved is congratulating themselves and burnishing their green image because they're, according to the calculations, they are... Um, you know, helping prevent climate change. One critique of that, of course, is that their calculations are wrong, that they're leaving things out, that the, the monocrop tree plantation that will grow after they cut down the forest um, doesn't sequester as much carbon. And besides, there's a time delay, and besides, soil is going to erode, and there's all kinds. So maybe we need, maybe the problem is that we didn't calculate enough. But suppose we did calculate everything. And it, the numbers still came out that it was going to help the CO2 problem. By that logic, we should do it. Something's left. So something, no matter how much we try to measure, something's always left out. And I want to bring this to a more personal level. Because most of the things that, that human beings do that make this world worth living in don't make any sense according to our instrumental logic on a macro scale. I'll just give a couple examples. Um, I'm speaking mostly of the small invisible things that people do from a place of compassion and care and love. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to raise examples I, I use in class, but is, it, is, that, is that all right? Okay. So I, I talked about the, the, the kid who I met who was, um, he spent a year as a volunteer at a, um, at a Steiner-influenced um, uh, facility where they, where they you know, take care of handicapped children. Camp Hill, it was called. 
and so these are you know, some severely handicapped children, and, and people are going and they're spending their whole, you know, a year of their lives, or the ones who work there, spending their whole lives um, making life better for these kids who would otherwise be in some horrible institution. And you hear the stories, they're very inspiring. You know, he, he, um, he was taking care of this one kid who had a neurological condition and he, could, he couldn't really walk, you know, and he couldn't really dress himself or do anything except when this volunteer was playing his guitar. And when he's playing this music, then the child could walk. And he felt that this was the most important thing in the world to be doing right now, to be playing his guitar so this child could walk. Recorded music wouldn't work. Had to be live guitar. Well, that's all very nice. But how is this going to help in the face of climate change, in the face of the several hundred nuclear power plants that haven't blown up yet, in the face of radioactive waste, in the face of the oceans being cleaned out of fish, in the face of, of the mass social injustice, the incarcerations, the, the genocides. You know, what, what good does it do to spend all that time? I mean, wouldn't it be a lot more efficient to lock those kids up in some facility Euthanize them even? Or what about the person who spends years and years, another story, a woman, she spent nine years taking care of her mother who was um, um, you know, unable to care for herself. And, and so every day she would, she would go and, and change her mother's bedpan, you know, change her diapers, buy her food, cook for her, do all of these thankless tasks, literally thankless, because her mother would yell at her every day. And none of her siblings would help. And then finally her mother dies. Well, can you, is there any way to calculate the contribution that that makes to the world? It escapes our systems of measurement. In fact, most of what escapes our systems of measurement um, are the things that have traditionally been done by women, where the men are out doing the big things, doing the things that Charles does. So Charles, uh, he's writing books and, and giving speeches to lots and lots of people. And so that'll have an effect on the world, because that's a big thing. In, in our understanding of cause and effect, we can say how that might, but even that, I mean, come on, compared to the power of the military, industrial, pharmaceutical, prison, agricultural, medical complex. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> Did I leave anything out? Banking. Uh, like, in the, compared to their power, nothing any of us can do, even if we're fairly well-known, can come anywhere close to counteracting the power that they have. So I'd like to, I'd like to um, kind of, so okay. There's a part of me that knows that what that mother was doing, what that young man with the guitar was doing, what all of us do, sometimes invisibly, there's a part of me that knows that these are every bit as significant an act as anything that I do or anything Barack Obama does. That there is another logic that truly runs the world in which all of us are equally powerful and in which every act has cosmic significance, in which every act sends ripples out into the universe and which necessarily come back. We can feel that that's true. When you're in the midst of that act of care, it feels like the most important thing in the world. Is that a lie? Is that something that we have to not listen to and steal ourselves to act by the numbers instead? Or is that part of the problem? Where did we learn to steal ourselves against what we really care about and act by the numbers instead? We learned that through our immersion in a money economy. That is the mentality of money. That's how we learned it. 
I'm not saying that we shouldn't measure things. I'm not saying we shouldn't have science. I mean, science, you can define, you can define science as the study of the measurable. And this is part of the uh, big picture story that is at the root of our crisis today. Nothing wrong with measuring things. It's a way to expand our vision and expand the scope of our care. But when we begin to choose based on the measurements, we get lost. The um, ambition of science, which you know, started with Galileo, really. Galileo, Descartes, um, David Hume, they basically said, you know, only the measurable is real. And human knowledge comes through expanding the realm of the measurable. And, and so some things in those times were totally mysterious, like life. That seemed to have nothing to do with physics. You know, in physics, things move according to, to they move in straight lines, you know, they don't spontaneously move like animals do. But eventually, that was, that entered the realm of science, genetics you know, biochemistry, um, and now even neurology, psychology, you know, even the realm of thought, consciousness, um, can become something that, that is within the realm of science. Um, so another basic uh, idea of science is that um, change in the world happens when you exert a force on a mass. And again, this was Galileo's discovery. Before Galileo, people thought that you needed to constantly exert a force to keep something moving. You know, like when the horse stops pulling, the cart rolls to a stop. And Galileo said, no, there's a counter force there. It's called friction. But if there weren't any friction, things would just keep going forever. Before then, people thought that there had to be, you know, why does the wind blow? Why do the, why do the animals move? Why does the earth turn? It's because God is doing all that, providing that constant Boy, this is starting to turn into a lecture. Um, let me, so let me take it back. So okay, where I want to go with this. I want to, I want this heart's logic that says that these are significant acts to um, no longer have to contradict and fight against the mind's logic. I want to offer a story of the world, a mythology, you could say, in which heart and mind can be united, in which th that somehow validates the significance of these small acts. I'll tell you one little story to illustrate it again. Um, but you know, I want to also say, um, Polly and I keep having these kind of synchronicities that, see, I think sometimes we get um, hints of, or, or glimpses of this other logic that this other system of cause and effect that it's not based on force, that's not based on control. Polly and I met for the first time near Paddington Station, right outside Paddington Station a couple years ago. Um, so on this trip, I had flown in and I had to get to Paddington Station to get the train here. So for some reason, I took the underground instead of the express takes a lot longer. Maybe I thought I'd save a few quid. I don't know. And so it took like a really long time. And then I wander out of the station, you know, and I'm like, I just kind of wander around for less than a minute. I'm like, okay, where's the, where's the, where do I get the tickets for the, for the regular train? And I, then I, then I hear a voice, Charles. I look up and Polly's just gotten out of the taxi right, right near where we met the first time. We had no plan to meet. I had no idea that she was taking the train. We had like, you know, it was just like this completely spontaneous coincidence. And, you know, one of those things, you know, you can say, well, that's just, you know, selective memory and the file drawer effect. And I'm not going to tell you the story about all the times I showed up at a train station and Polly wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Selection bias, right? But when it happens again and again and again, it doesn't prove anything, but it's an offering of another story, an offering of a story that says that, that there is an intelligence 
in the world outside of ourselves. Now that is a statement that the mind of, du of duality, the mind of separation, is very alarmed by. Because it seems to be saying that there is some external divinity, some intelligence outside of ourselves. It's kind of a fairy tale. It's kind of a fantasy, you know. We don't need, right? it seems like a throwback to religion and anti-scientific and very dangerous given the amount of damage that denial of science is doing in the world, right? So, so am I talking about in intelligent design? Am I arguing for an external divinity? No, I'm saying something a lot more radical than that. I'm not saying that human beings have intelligence, consciousness, and beingness, selfhood, and the world does not, except that there is God outside the world infusing it into the matter. I'm saying no. I'm saying that intrinsically, all beings have a kind of intelligence, a kind of beingness, that they are a self, that the qualities of a self are not in human beings alone. You could say that this would be the, the final stage of the Copernican revolution that said we're not at the center. We're not physically at the center. The earth goes around the sun. The sun is a little blip on the edge of the galaxy. Now we're also saying we're not at the center of the psychic universe either that all things have beingness. And this is, I, I've, I've noticed that um, I, I have an interest in um, unorthodox scientific theories and phenomena that are excluded, <laughs> called you know, pseudoscience or um, said to be hoaxes or not to exist, things like, you know, oh, even if I list them, I'm going to torpedo my credibility. <laughs> um, but what the heck? Um, it's probably too late. <laughs> things like crop circles, things like water memory, things like homeopathy, things like energy medicine, things like sh shamanism, um, psi phenomena, um, alternative medicine, um, acupuncture homeopathy, whatever, those kinds of things. What is in common among all of those things that excites such, such vitriol among the defenders of scientific orthodoxy? They all say in some way that there's an intelligence outside of ourselves. Just to pick one example, homeopathy says that every condition of a human being is mirrored by some substance in the universe. So human and universe are not separate. There's a mirroring there. Um, something like crop circles, obviously, you know, they're, if they're authentic, there's some non-human intelligence that is making them happen. Personally, I don't think that it's UFOs. Um, I think that they just come by to check it out because they're like... <laughs> 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 They're like, wow, you know, this is amazing. But, but what if, like, what would really blow my mind is if they just happen. And there is no explanation, but they just happen. They're just an expression of this universal intelligence. Now, this, this is a viewpoint, actually. It seems um, kind of suspect, kind of new agey um, to say that, that, that something outside a human being has the qualities of a self. For example, purpose, intelligence, consciousness, desire. Most human beings who have ever lived on Earth would accept that as a matter of course. That, that, that there's sentience in everything. It's only we, modern people, who have outgrown that um, and ascribe such beliefs to you know, childish superstition. And indeed, it's something that children believe as well. They, they, they you know, have their teddy bear, and they love their teddy bear, and they say their teddy bear is hungry now, and now the teddy bear wants to go to bed, and they put it in the bed, and they cover it up with colors, covers. You know. and, and eventually we grow out of that, and we know that that is just an anthropomorphic projection, 
a projection of human qualities. I mean, after all, it's just a bunch of stuff, stuffing. You know, it's just some cloth. It's just some molecules. It's just some protons, neutrons, and electrons bouncing around together, held together by impersonal forces. That's all it is. We grow out of, we grow out of thinking that it actually is a self, just as civilized man has grown out of the superstitious primitive belief that, that the soil has feelings and that the water has desires and that it's a sacred being and that it deserves respect and that it can be loved. It's childish to love your teddy bear, you know? So equally, it would be childish to love this planet Earth. It's an anthropomorphic projection, sorry, because really all it is is a biochemical scum on top of a ball of rock. And we can describe, <laughs> we can describe the scum and the rock by chemistry, which we can describe by physics. And ultimately, it comes down to a few generic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, that behave according to mathematical forces. Anything else is a projection. That's the ideology that we live in. It's an obsolete ideology. Um, it's not only, um, well, it's breaking down from the inside and has been for 90 years ever since quantum mechanics came along in which things seem to happen that aren't caused by a force. A particle, one atom, a uranium atom, this one decays right away. That one decays in 15 minutes that one decays in a few hours. That one takes a year to decay. Why? The same forces are, they're all subject to the same forces. They're all supposedly identical in every measurable respect. Our measurement cannot distinguish between the circumstances of these two uranium atoms. Yet one decays now and one decays later. Why? An indigenous person would have no problem. Say, well, one of them chose to do it now, one of them chose to do it later. They're, you know, they, they, they have this quality of choice. You can look at quantum mechanics and say choice is elemental. And that is not among any of the six or seven standard interpretations of, you know, popular interpretations of quantum mechanics. Usually it's chalked up to a causality or randomness which says, yeah, 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 they're all identical. They're all these generic particles. Um, and it just, just happens that way. And that's not very satisfying either. So there's this, there's this kind of flaw at the heart of the reductionist mechanistic paradigm. So I think what I'll do is I'll just finish there's a lot of territory I want to cover here. Um, but I'll just say that this, what I'm calling the rapidly becoming obsolete scientific worldview, and again, I'm not saying that such a worldview is useless. Really more that it's exceeded its proper bounds and usurped the domain of other ways of knowing. But it fits very comfortably into what I would call our story of the world, our mythology. Every culture has a mythology which answers basic questions like, who are you? Why are you here? Where did you come from? Where are you going? What's important? What's valuable? Who are we as a species? How does change happen in the world? What's the nature of reality? What is the destiny of humanity? Questions like that. How did the world begin? Every culture has stories and answers to these questions, and so do we. And we don't think that these are just stories. We think that they're reality because we test them with the scientific method. But the scientific method itself is based on a story. For example, the story of objectivity that says that there's a reality outside of ourselves that's separate from us. So that's, that, that's, that's one part of our basic mythology. And basically it says who you are is a separate individual among other separate individuals. 
in a world that does not have the qualities of self. So you are a bubble of psychology bouncing around inside your flesh machine, or you are a soul encased in flesh, or you are um, a self-interested economic man or a woman, or you are uh, the uh, phenotypic expression of your DNA that programs you to maximize rational reproductive self-interest. Um, all of these different conceptions of what a person is more or less agree with each other. Another part of the story says that because the world outside of ourselves does not have these properties of intelligence and innate tendency to organ, organization and a direction of movement and a purpose, because of that, well-being comes through controlling this external, indifferent substrate of force and mass. Goodness comes through control. And we see the expression of that in our medical system, in our educational system, in foreign policy, in American foreign policy in particular, in agriculture. Um, one way to phrase that is um, in terms of the conquest of evil. A very basic paradigm that even among those of us who are attracted to a new story, to a new mythology, and I should say it's a new and ancient mythology, we still run a lot of these habits of separation. I'll call the old story separation. We run a lot of these habits unconsciously. So one of these habits is the conquest of evil, which originated maybe 5,000 years ago with agriculture when evil was associated with chaos and the wild and good was associated with order and the domestic realm. And so the, the, the hero was one who brought order to the wild through conquest. And then we turned the program of conquest inward as well to conquer the inner wild, to ascend above our animal state. So here's another aspect of the old story, which is ascent, transcendence, the conquest of nature, the conquest of self, the rising above the flesh into the realm of the spirit, the rising above of biology into the realm of mind, into the realm of reason, and then physically literalized eventually through the human transcendence of nature, going off into space, synthetic food, robot body parts, computer consciousness, so on and so forth. All part of the same movement, all part of the same story, all part of the same myth, and all becoming obsolete in our time. All falling apart, and this has been with us for thousands of years, increasingly, in more and more intensely. Very rudimentary, thousands of years ago. But seemingly within reach in the last hundred years. People seriously believed, 50 years ago, seriously believed that we would soon complete our conquest of nature. And you see the images, the bubble cities, you know, and the space colonies and things like that. We wouldn't need nature anymore. This was what any idealistic young person would be excited about 50 years ago. They didn't want to go into permaculture like half the people in this room. You know, they wanted to be a nuclear scientist. You, know? you would, if you, 50 or 100 years ago, if you developed a way to cut down the forests faster, you didn't have to greenwash yourself. You didn't have to apologize for it. You'd be celebrated, you know, because that story was strong then. Today, the story is, is hollowing out from the inside partly because it hasn't brought the promised benefits, the promised technological utopia. So in various ways, each one of us is exploring this transition from the story of separation to the story of interbeing, I like to call it, a phrase I've been told is coined by Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, which basically answers these questions in a different way. Who are you? You are the totality of your relationships, which means that everything happening in the world mirrors something happening in you. Everything you do to the world, you're doing to yourself. Any re relationship that you have shows you something about you. Anything that happens in one place 
happens everywhere and is happening to you. Rupert Sheldrake calls, well, one way to look at it is through his theory of morphic resonance, which says that any change that happens in one place creates kind of a field of change that makes that change happen more easily somewhere else. And he gives all kinds of um, very intriguing examples of this that when you take them on their own merits outside the lens of scientific orthodoxy are very hard to refute, very hard to explain away. You have to go through um, a lot of mental calisthenics to dismiss his arguments, um, which hasn't stopped him from being public enemy number one in some quarters. But So here is perhaps that, that way of aligning the heart's logic with the mind's logic. In the story of interbeing, it makes our feeling that this is a significant act makes total sense. Anything you do out of compassion, out of love, out of generosity, gratitude, forgiveness, strengthens the field of those things so that they more easily happen everywhere. We're all in transition, though. To, it's, it's hard to believe that. It's hard to believe after a lifetime immersed in this old story. It's hard to believe this innate knowledge that we all have. Two pieces. One, our every act has cosmic significance. Two, the world outside of ourselves is alive and intelligent and conscious. I think that the hostility to, to, and the discomfort with those things. I, I, was, I spoke at a conference um, and talking about the living planet and afterwards I was taken to task saying, you know, you're going to really make us look bad. We can only say that the planet behaves as if it were alive. We cannot say it's actually alive. We're going to be called unscientific. We're going to be ridiculed. Mm. What was your last sentence again? We'll be ridiculed. We'll be called on. The, 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 it's, it's not alive, but it's X like alive. Did you say Right. That? Yeah. yeah, we're only allowed to say that, that you know, Gaia behaves like a living system. Yeah. Right? But we can't say it's actually alive. Uh -huh. That, like, let, in fact, let's distance ourselves from those tree huggers. Tree huggers. Why would someone hug a tree? You know, that's some. some you know, that, that's some ridiculous hippie thing because, because to hug a tree means that you actually think that a tree is huggable, that it actually has feelings, that it actually can communicate with you. And we've outgrown that. But why is that threatening? And so one, of, one of the people in our group um, shared this. I mean, I keep hearing stories like this, you know, when you go to your parents and you say, maybe not in these words, but you say, I'm going to live my life according to my knowledge that everything I do has cosmic significance and that as I give, so I shall necessarily receive and, um, and, the, and life is sacred and we are one and love runs the world. I'm going to live my life like that, okay? Mom, dad. <laughs> Mom and dad don't always respond very well. Uh, and on one level, they're worried. You know, will you be okay? Because they have deeply internalized the story of, of the separate self, which has to compete in the world of the separate self. More for me is less for you. Because there's this external universe out there, you know, and whoever controls more, then other people control less. I mean, this is the reality that they've grown, grown up in. Not only the ideology they've grown up in, but the economy they've grown up in. This isn't just some mental thing. Our, all of our systems embody separation. In our money economy, it sure does seem like more for you is less for me. In fact, the money system is designed that way. It has scarcity built into it because of the way money is created as interest-bearing debt, always more debt than there is money. That's a whole other talk. Um, <laughs> but but so our, our, you know, our, our parents and ourselves, too, to the extent that anyone who grew up in this society is going to be um, indoctrinated 
and immersed and imbued with the perceptions of separation. So you, you go to your parents and you say, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So part of it is that they're worried for you um, because they've so internalized the idea that, that well-being comes through control. But there's another reason for their reaction. It's because you're reminding them of what they know. And whether it's your parents or someone else in society, you're reminding them of what they've lost. You're reminding them of this knowledge that got crushed and betrayed. One of our students, one of, our, one of the people in our class, whose permission I have to share this story, um, sent her daughter to school. She came back. She was just got, she said, this girl, Ruby, became just a different person and unhappy. And she came back and said, Mommy, they won't even let us look up. Sometimes I just want to look up. But when I do, my teacher says I have to look down at my work. One of her classmates, they, they found tufts of hair under her pillow because she was so anxious tearing out her hair. And so she went to the mother went to confront the teacher, and the teacher said, don't worry, she'll get used to it. <laughs> and this is just one example of the betrayal of our child's knowledge that the world is supposed to be more beautiful than what we've been offered as normal and more alive than what we've been told that it is. That we're not supposed to, that's not normal to hate Monday. But we take that for granted almost. That all the new buildings aren't supposed to be ugly, you know? And so these, this knowledge gets, gets, gets painfully crushed and betrayed. And so when you awaken it, when you awaken the knowledge that, that you know, here is a being, you know, that has, that has selfhood. I mean, you look at it and you know it, you know. It, it's, it's, you enter that child's mind. It's not absurd to ascribe sadness to these plants that were cut off to be here. Sadness, but also I'm feeling like they're kind of okay with it, actually. <laughs> I don't know why. I wouldn't be, but it um, has something to do with this incredible abundance. Um, but it's not an absurdity. To, 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 but it doesn't fit into, our, into our, our mythology. And it triggers this pain that we all carry. It's the pain of separation takes many forms. It's the pain of being cut off from our larger being, which is our interconnected being, our interbeing. It's a painful wound. Here's another element of the new and ancient story. The purpose of human life. What is it? In the world of separation, it's to survive and reproduce. It's to be as safe and secure as possible, to exercise as much control as possible, to maximize rational self-interest. What would the purpose of life be in an interbeing world where your well-being is aligned with the well-being of all? This is a fairly new concept. Biology, for example, it wasn't too long ago that, that they thought that there were harmful species, neutral species, and beneficial species, and humanity, humans could, could make the world better by weeding out the harmful species. Now we understand that you eliminate any species and everybody's worse off. Why? Because every species has a gift to give. 
<coughs> toward the well-being of the whole. Something that, again, indigenous people totally understood. They, understood, they, they saw the world through a cosmology of gift. Well, the purpose of a human being, of course, becomes to give our gifts toward the well-being of something larger. When we're reminded, when someone who has, through no fault of their own, but been imprisoned in a life where they are not giving their gifts towards something meaningful and beautiful, beautiful to them, being reminded of that by a young person is very frightening just as it's frightening and painful to be reminded of the living quality of all things, the sacredness of all things. So one way to deal with that is to ridicule it, to other it. But I think, so here I'm going to circle back to the war on evil and then lead you in a little dialogue process and then another process. Um, I think it's important to understand that everybody in civilization suffers some form of this wound of separation. And that the behavior that we judge is an expression of this wound. But instead, we go to war against the expression, the symptom, without healing the wound. I'll raise the... Uh, the example of the rats in cages again. Um, we talked about that in class. Uh, so in the 1940s, B.F. Skinner, the psychologist, did some experiments. And other people did these experiments too on rats. And they presented the rats with a choice, food or heroin. And the rats chose the heroin again and again and again until they starved to death. Conclusion. Our Desires are our enemy, that we can only rise above our animal world through control over ourselves, through civilization, through education, through making decisions from the mind. Um, and by the way, the whole drug war originated from, from these experiments or was fed by these experiments too, because if that's what the rats are going to do, you have to either scare them into not doing it. That's called education or punishment. Um, you know, make a punishment so bad that they'll not do this, uh, or um, you have to, you know, cut off the supply of drugs, interdiction, right? So the whole drug war comes from this, and, and a whole way of seeing hu human nature and seeing the world. Well, in the 1980s and 90s, another psychologist repeated the experiment. Bruce Alexander was his name, and he took the rats out of their cages and put them in rat paradise which was this gigantic pen with, with you know, lots of everything that rats like. Uh, lots of social interaction, you know, like, um, like fun little tunnels and things like that. And just, it was, it was rat park, he called it. <laughs> and in this environment, they chose food. They might try the heroin once, not that interested. They would choose the food. And even rats who were physiologically addicted, who were taken out of their cages and put in the rat park, would uh, um, dehabituate de themselves from, from the heroin and they would, they would become unaddicted. Uh, so it makes me think, and this research was, was basically ignored for decades. But it makes you, you wonder. Do you differentiate between hmm. desire and greed? Do I differentiate between desire and greed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so let, let me talk about greed. Greed, I would say, is a symptom of the cutoff from what we really need. So, because greed is, is really a form of addiction. It's wanting more and more and more of something that doesn't really serve your well-being. It's a kind of insanity. So what makes somebody greedy? What makes somebody into a a consumer of things they don't need. Well, if you're cut off from the true self, all your relationships, if uh, you're cut off from community, cut off from intimate connection with the stories of the people around you, where every face is 
somebody you know that you know you, you, they're, that are in your your web of being. I know your grandfather's story. I know your father's story. I know your children's stories. I know who you are. You know who I am. Therefore, I know who I am, and I know the the, the name of every tree and the the smell of its flower and what kind of birds nest in that tree and what the song of those birds is and what and and you know what plants that bird uses for its nest and what the medicinal use of those plants are and I'm in this web of being where I know who I am and where I am and what I am through my relationships and I feel at home in the universe like if I don't have that if I'm cut off and caged into this little separate self I'm hungry for this lost beingness I want to to, to feel that I exist. And one way to do that, well, it could be through overeating, you know, giving that momentary feeling of connection to the universe. It could be through over shopping. It could be through um, uh, using control as a substitute for feeling at home. See that connection there? If you don't feel at ease, if you don't feel secure, then you have to control everything. So I think greed comes from this kind of artificially induced scarcity. In a state of abundance, greed makes no sense at all. Where is desire? Desire, desire comes, okay, I might need to do my little dance here. Um, <laughs> desire <laughs> comes from an unmet need. But we go to war against the desires without meeting the need. Sometimes, well, when it's working right, desire does help you meet the need. Like if you desire to breathe, or if you're hungry and you desire to eat, it's coming from an unmet need. But, but for many reasons, the true object of the desire is hidden from us. It's blocked somehow, unavailable. Uh, the desire for play, the desire to explore our boundaries, you know, the desire for adventure, the desire for intimacy, in so many ways, blocked. So then it comes out in some other way, you know. If you don't have, like, real intimacy in your life, then maybe you're going to have a, a pornography addiction because that's all that's available. And then you say, shame on you. What's wrong with you? You've got to control that. You know, so you control that. But if the need for intimacy isn't met, then that desire is going to come out in some other way. It's an unstoppable force. The life force is an unstoppable force. So, yeah. Um, let me... Um, just quickly take this into politics and social action and just offer you a small process. And um, I, I was going to quickly return to, so I was saying like we have these habits of separation. One of them is the war on evil and uh, the perception that change happens through force. So here we are environmentalists and we want to um, stop fracking or we want to... Um, uh, stop Monsanto from privatizing seeds uh, or something like that, right? Lots of causes that we're interested in. From the mindset of force and conquering evil, first what we do is we identify the bad guy, find somebody to hate, arouse as much hatred and anger towards this person as possible or towards this company or towards this something identifiable, and then overcome them with force. Because they're the bad guy. They don't really, they, they want to be doing this. They are greedy. They are evil. They are something. They are an other. They are not as I am. If I were in that position, I wouldn't be doing as that, as they do. They don't have a quality of care, compassion, love for life that I have. They are different, they are other. Can you see how this mindset is absolutely part of the old story? And even if we win a temporary victory, we're strengthening the psychic substructure of the system. Plus, we usually don't win. And in fact, the, there's a hidden psychological motivation in a lot of this activist work, which is by naming somebody else as bad, evil, other, wrong, we're saying that I am good. So it becomes a vehicle for self-approval and self-love. Um, and you see a lot of this in activist groups, you know, online and stuff. Basically, it's like 
You're right, I'm right, we're good, you're good, I'm good. Unlike those people over there, the conservatives, the, what's it called, the U UKIP, what is it? <laughs> you know, um, who are appalling, who are deficient in some quality of humanity. You know, they are less rational, less intelligent, they're closed-minded, they're morally or intellectually deficient in some way. Unlike us, we're good, they're not. So if that's the, to the extent, I'm not going to, I'm generalizing here, but to the extent that that motivation is present, what you will achieve is precisely the self-image of oneself as good, moral, smart, ethical, and so on. What you will not achieve is any change in the world. So I think it's important to, to recognize where the war on evil comes from on a psychological level so that we can actually be effective. If it were true that people do evil things because they're evil people and good things because they're good people, then we would have no alternative but to overcome them by force. And that would be a recipe for despair because, as I said before, they have more force at their disposal than we do. But if it's not true, then we'd better wake up from that delusion. This idea that people do good things because they're good people and bad things because they're bad people, in psychology, this is known as the fundamental attribution error. It's part of an ideology called dispositionism. Whereas the alternative, which fits into the new story, as I've been calling it, is called situationism. And it says that people do, that people act as a result of the totality of their situation. Therefore, if I were you, I would do as you do. We are one. But very, very often we kind of habitually reenact this, this um, paradigm of conquest. It, it, it immerses us. You know, every movie, every action movie has the same plot. Some inexplicably evil person is causing a problem and the solution is to conquer, humiliate, destroy, kill the evil person and then the problem's solved. Even like, you know, movies that have in other ways a good message like Avatar, you know, what's the fundamental problem? It's the evil general and the, the, the plot is basically over when the evil general is killed. The Lion King, The Little Mermaid, you know, all of these movies with very few exceptions. There was one recent exception, the Lego movie which I took my kids to watch, and I thought it was total trash. Um, and if you don't want a plot spoiler, then I should, then you have to close your ears. Um, but the, the final, at the, at the, at the kind of climactic scene, they've lost. The evil guy is going to win, but then something happens that makes him relent. He has a change of heart. There is no hope for this planet without a change of heart. Another way to put it is that in this revolution, everybody's coming with us. It's not yet another campaign against the evil ones, the bad guys, the, you name it. We've had a lot of those campaigns, the Jews, the fascists, the communists, the bourgeoisie. Even the, the Occupy movement, like, we are the 99%. We should be right. the 100%. The 100%. Yeah. Percent. yeah. Which, is, which is to be able to look at someone in the 1% and say, and say, not shame on you, but say, I know this isn't working for you either. <laughs> which is obvious. I mean, look at the depression rates in the affluent countries. My son, 17 years old, he says, Dad, this, he told me this a couple weeks ago. Dad, all of my friends are depressed. I'm the only happy one. <laughs> and they think it's normal to be that way. Should I do the thing about the models and stuff? Like, we know it's normal. Like, look at the, the models, you know. These are like the, the, the image of, like, you know, the perfect human, right, in our culture. And they're all unhappy. Like, there's, like, these half-starved, miserable women on billboards all over the place, you know? You never see a model with, like, a big grin on her face, you know? Like, look how beautiful I am, you know? Like, my beautiful, like, they're like... 
anyway, that's kind of like a, 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 like a barometer, you know, of our condition, I think. Um, so, okay. So something really practical here. From the perspective of evil people do evil things, from the perspective of force, how do you change things? You know, you exert a force on them, um, uh, the force of a psychological force, a financial force. How do you make somebody into an environmentalist if they just don't care as much as you do? Well, one way is to make them feel ashamed, which is a psychological force that, that taps into self-rejection and conditional self-approval. Uh, and if you, if you start to recycle and you vote for the Greens, then you get to be in the in-group and you get to approve of yourself. Another kind of force is bribery, to say, you know, think of all of the uh, uh, economic losses that'll happen because of climate change, and this is the best business decision to support, you know, CO2 abatement, and, um, and, uh, and your company will get PR benefits from acting in an ecologically uh, ethical way, bribery. Uh, another way is, well, coercive force, of course, um, there's another important one. I'm drawing a blank. Anyway. How do you make them change? But if you look at yourself, I'm willing to... Oh, another one would be to scare them into it. You know, your future generations... What will happen to the planet if we don't change our ways? Scare people into being environmentalists. And even if you ask people, why, why do you care? People will often say, well, it's because I fear for my children's future. I think that that's not the real reason. I think that that's a, a, a self-delusion. I think that what turns somebody into an environmentalist is an experience of beauty and grief. What turns you into an environmentalist and what keeps you being an environmentalist? It could just be, you know, a picture of a sea turtle with its belly full of plastic. It could be the woods that you wandered in when you were a kid that and you go back there and there's the bulldozer. Something that was beautiful to you that's lost. And that means if we want to turn people into environmentalists, we have to create conditions that, where they can access the beauty and the grief.